I'm pleased to welcome you to this IMF Summer School course preview on the macroeconomics of climate change, science, economics, and policies. In this free online course, you'll learn about the science and economics related to climate change, the framework for global climate action, and how the IMF engages on climate change issues. In the course, we identify the causes of climate change and the source and types of emissions and the physical damages of climate change. We explain the potential consequences of climate change on our economies and on human welfare. We describe the progress, challenges, and opportunities in the global frameworks to address climate issues. And we explain why and how the IMF engages its member countries to address climate change and its impacts. You can register for the full MCCX course at the link below. So if you're interested in understanding the issues at the intersection of macroeconomics and climate change, I hope you'll join us. We are now turning from the physical changes in the climate system to the economic consequences of those changes. In the first step, we'll consider some important impact mechanisms for climate change to cause economic harm. At a global scale, disaster cause more than 1% of GDP. However, these costs are very unevenly distributed. In advanced economy, disasters have a positive effect on GDP, on average, due to fast reconstruction and large public relief spending. However, it should be noted that it does not capture the capital store wealth destruction effects of disasters. The less developed countries are, the more severe the impact of climate change, especially for small island states. Disasters also hamper the economic convergence of poorer countries. Climate change also threatens global food security by reducing agricultural productivity. For example, sea level rise reduces agricultural land, while drought reduces agricultural productivity. In addition to the magnitude of the food security challenge posed by climate change, this graph also shows that tropical countries are most severely impacted. Low agricultural productivity reduces food supply and increases food prices. They create food insecurity, especially in low-income countries. Reduce agricultural productivity and other effects of climate change also cause mass migration of people. This graph from the World Bank report shows that climate change could internally displace more than 140 million people by 2050. Related to the problem of large scale migration is the concern that climate change also contributes to violent conflict. This graph shows that temperature increases are linked to an increased risk of civil wars, although the causal link is not straightforward. For developing countries with limited resources, the effects of climate change, including mass migration and conflicts, can be compounded. For example, due to limited adaptation capacities, developing countries are likely to experience long-lasting impacts of short-term weather anomalies, slower economic recovery following natural disasters, and greater vulnerability to future shocks. Across countries, poor households have limited ability to adapt to the effects of climate change. Reflecting this, climate change could push over 100 million people into extreme poverty by 2030, according to the World Bank. The World Bank estimates that more than 100 million additional people might be pushed into extreme poverty by 2030 due to climate change. Even on the best case low impact scenario, the outcomes will still be severe. Up to 38 million additional people will experience abject poverty due to climate change. Rising food prices, widespread vector-borne diseases, and increasing frequency of disasters 
are some of the channels through which climate change increases poverty. Despite all the large damages for climate extremes that we have discussed so far, it is worth noting the uncertainty associated with these estimates. In addition to climate science-related uncertainties, the lack of clear answers to the following questions creates further uncertainties. Do temperature increases affect the level or growth rate of output? Are past climate trends and damages good enough for predicting future damages? Can we accurately quantify spillover risk from climate change? For these and several other reasons, estimates of the impact of climate change are highly uncertain. On this graph, on a global warming of 3.5 degrees Celsius, the output effect ranges from a large increase in global GDP to a large decrease, with a negative central case of 25% of GDP losses. Such large output losses will significantly increase global income inequality, as indicated by this graph. Note that the effects of tipping points, spillovers, or other risks are not included in these estimates. It is important to emphasize that the effects of climate change cannot be captured in a single GDP number. For example, threats to food security, infant mortality, and human development in general are not adequately captured in GDP. Some of these are shown in the graphics here. Furthermore, even if the aggregate effect of a climate event is moderate on average, some groups and regions will be affected very strongly. As we have discussed so far, climate change poses severe risk with large damages. The earlier and more decisive emissions are reduced to zero, the more damages are avoided. Putting the world on a proper footing to achieve carbon neutrality. Early and targeted climate policy actions avoid premature deaths, raises revenue from carbon pricing, and creates millions of jobs in low carbon industries. It is now scientifically clear that human activity is the leading cause of climate change. As our carbon footprints get larger, so are the increases in surface temperature, natural disasters, sea level rise, and the loss of biodiversity. The resulting imbalances in the Irish climate system have wide-ranging implications for socioeconomic stability, lower productivity and output losses, deteriorating health outcomes, increased migration, poverty and inequality, and heightened macroeconomic and financial instability. To avoid the worst of these damages, there is a clear path forward. Greenhouse gas emissions need to be substantially reduced as quickly as possible. I'm first going to give some background on how emissions have evolved. This is important to understand as context for international discussions of responsibilities and commitments. As we know, greenhouse gases are long lived in the atmosphere. So what matters is the cumulative emissions over many years. This chart shows how fossil fuel CO2 emissions have grown as different countries have industrialized at different times. The vertical axis shows gigatons of CO2 emitted per year. So the areas in this chart show cumulative contributions to current concentrations. A few points from this chart. First, up until about 1950, the vast bulk of emissions were coming from Western Europe and the US. We then had a period up to around 1980 where they were growing strongly across the board, and notably in the Soviet bloc, which had an extremely energy-intensive economy. And then more recently, we've seen diverging trends. Advanced countries have generally reduced emissions as they've become more energy efficient, and their growth has been focused on non-industrial sectors. The collapse of the Soviet Union led to a huge reduction in emissions from Eastern Europe. And emerging market emissions have expanded very rapidly, especially in Asia, as they've taken over as the world industrial centers, often with high energy intensity. These trends reflect the general trajectory of emissions observed as countries develop. 
First, emissions increase rapidly with economic growth, but then they begin to slow and eventually fall. We can see this pattern very clearly when we switch to a split by economic category, with EMs contributing a rapidly growing share of emissions, while developed country emissions have been dropping recently. And these trends are expected to continue going forward, as EMs continue to grow more strongly. These projections are based on current policies, so-called business as usual. In terms of emissions per capita, emerging markets mostly emit much less than advanced countries. For example, Australia, Canada, Saudi Arabia and the US all emit about twice as much per capita as China and nearly 10 times as much as India. But this gap is closing and varies by country. The key point here is that it's no solution without major reductions by both developed and developing countries. Meanwhile, you may not even have noticed the sliver at the top of representing low-income countries, which continue to have extremely low level of emissions, both in absolute terms and per capita. Many of the countries most vulnerable to climate change are in this group. So where do emissions need to go to be consistent with global temperature goals? As we'll see, the Paris Agreement aims to keep temperature increases well below 2 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial times. And there's a lot of evidence that damage has increased significantly beyond 1.5 degrees C. These lines show the emissions paths consistent with these goals. Clearly, there's a huge discrepancy between the path the world is on and the path it needs to be on. And the longer we stay on the unsustainable path, the more rapid the turnaround needs to be to get back on track. Now that we have some background on the problem, let's turn to the search for solutions. The greenhouse effect of CO2 and other gases in the atmosphere, and the potential link to fossil fuel emissions, was first identified back in the 19th century. But it was not until the 1970s and 80s that the scientific consensus started to grow that this was indeed a looming threat. This chart shows some of the key milestones in international negotiations on climate change, against the backdrop of continuing rising emissions. International efforts started in earnest with the establishment of the International Panel on Climate Change in 1988, and the first international treaty, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, in 1992. The UNFCCC was signed by 154 states at the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992 committing collectively to reduce atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. The UNFCCC established the Conference of the Parties, the COP, which has met annually since 1995. The first major attempt to operationalize this commitment and to address the inherent collective action problem was the Kyoto Protocol of 1997. This established legally binding obligations for advanced economies to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. However, the US never ratified Kyoto, dropping out in 2001, and Canada withdrew in 2012. The other developed country parties, mostly in Europe, did meet their targets. But falling emissions in these countries have been much more than offset by rising emissions elsewhere. The draft Copenhagen Accord of 2009 aimed to cap global warming at below 2 degrees C, proposing emissions targets for 2020 by developed countries and to mitigation actions by developing countries to slow their emissions growth. However, only a subset of countries signed up to the accord, which was not formally adopted. Copenhagen was generally seen as a failure. But in the following years, groundwork continued for discussions culminating in the Paris Agreement of 2015. This agreement was, at last, a comprehensive deal signed by virtually every country in the world, recognizing that all had a role to play in reducing emissions. This remains the framework governing international efforts today. So how is the Paris Agreement working in practice? What we find is that the features that made it possible to reach such a comprehensive agreement are the very same features that make it difficult for the agreement to be fully effective. First, universal membership. This is a key feature of Paris that gives it legitimacy and credibility. But trying to negotiate between 195 signatories, many with very low emissions levels themselves, is not easy. The voluntary nature of the pledges was essential to get everyone on board. But it means free riding is still a concern, where some countries would prefer to leave it to others to solve the collective problem. Also, 
Paris does not require countries to commit to how they will achieve their pledges, which can create a credibility gap. This is why people talk about twin gaps under Paris. An ambition gap, whereby the pledges don't add up to the emissions reductions needed, plus a policy gap, whereby the policies being implemented aren't enough to meet the pledges. And as we noted before, pledges are often expressed using different parameters, reducing transparency and making it harder to compare ambition across countries. The ratchet mechanism is intended to help get round these issues and raise ambition when it's assessed to be inadequate. However, just as with the original agreement, there's no mechanism to ensure that the identified gaps will actually be closed. Another important strength of Paris is the commitment to a long-term temperature stabilization goal, which implies that the world will have to move to net zero emissions, meaning any release of greenhouse gases will have to be matched by corresponding reductions, either by natural carbon sinks like reforestation or artificially by carbon capture and storage technology. And indeed, increasing numbers of countries have committed to get to net zero by either 2050 or 2060. This is very welcome, although there can be a risk that these lofty long-term goals can distract from the critical action that's needed in the near term. Conditional pledges are an important way for Paris to raise mitigation ambition in developing countries, but they depend on the hope for climate finance actually coming through. Finally, any economist will see the potential for beneficial trading in greenhouse gas emissions. If the marginal cost to abate a ton of CO2 is lower in a developing country than a developed one, say, it seems a no-brainer for the developed country or firms in that country to pay for the reduction to be done in the developing country. Such schemes are often called offsets or voluntary carbon credits. This Pareto improving trade is what Article 6 of the Paris Agreement seeks to exploit. However, it's hard to ensure that emissions reductions in the developing country are really additional to what would have happened otherwise. So there's a risk that the advanced country reduces its abatement without getting the corresponding higher abatement abroad.